<clears throat> Hi, welcome. I am so excited to be here today. Thank you for joining me here at Designs and Machine Embroidery. I'm Eileen Roach, and I'm uh, have an exciting guest that's going to who's going to join me today, Anne McCarthy, and we'll get to her in a little bit. But before we get started, could you just sign in and let me know where you are, like what city you're in today. And also give a shout out to your local dealer. So I'd love to see their names in the comments because if you're like me, you're missing your local dealer, right? You wanna be in that shop, browsing the fabric aisles, taking classes, that kind of thing, right? So, um, I, I know that uh, many of the dealers most certainly miss you, miss all of you. So it's important that we uh, reach out to them, keep their names in front of us, right? And uh, so once you do that, I'm kind of waiting for some comments. I don't really see anybody. Let's see. Um, I hope everything is okay. Uh, there we go. Janie Tietzen is from Brandon. Um, Mississippi Cotton Blossom Fabrics, that's awesome. And Fred in um, Knoxville, Tennessee, Mid-South Sewing, love that. Uh, Maryland, aren't we all missing our dealers? Definitely. It's been uh, quite a while now, and it's going to be a little bit longer. But after that, we're going to get back to regular business, right? And I know many of you are home sewing up a storm. I know myself, I have been working on a new... Um, neckline collection. I finished one quilt. I'm in the process of a second quilt and I've been making masks just like many of you are making masks. I know sewing machine retailers are finding a way to be open, you know, within um, in the government guidelines so that they can allow you to come in and pick up supplies and also many of the dealers are coordinating local efforts on making masks and getting them to healthcare workers, grocery store workers, you know, all those people that are out there on the front line that have to work and boy, we're grateful for them, aren't they? But I learned that when you make masks um, for a group of people, let's say at home, right? Your whole family, maybe there's five people in your house. And if you're like me, maybe you've made all five from the same fabric. And then you, you hand them out to everybody in the family and nobody knows whose is who, right? So I have a solution there for you. Um, let's see. And Fred, you're making lots of masks with help from Karen at Mid-South. That's awesome. That's awesome. And Cindy Murphy Taylor at Round Rock, so much more. Oh, really, it's so great to read all these names. And Misha Pennington, you're having to make masks for um, compromised family members. Good idea. But you know, really, we feel, um, we've heard now, Dr. Fauci, my new hero for sure, tells us we should be wearing masks all the time So when we're out in public. And why not? My goodness, we have sewing machines. We can easily do that. So, uh, and Judy Warren, you are uh, out in Hawaii on the big island and um, Discount Fabric Warehouse is promoting the mask and keeping you notified about Alaska. Alaska does, uh, Alaska, <laughs> elastic seems to be, uh, uh, you know, hard to find in some stores, but I know that there's sources online. So reach out to your local dealer. They can most certainly steer you in the right direction. So I'm gonna share my uh, PowerPoint screen so that you can see what I recently did. So um, I made the, on the left-hand side are gray masks, and I actually just cut up an old T-shirt and I was able to make eight masks from that T-shirt fabric. And what I monogrammed a digit, the le you know the number one, two, three, all the way through ten on each individual mask, so that when I gave that to my local grocery store and they handed them out to their employees, it was um, you know a way for each person to identify which one was theirs. And then the two on the right hand side are um, these masks were actually made for my company from our dear friends over in Bangkok, Thailand. They sent us uh, a whole, like several dozen masks for our families and employees, which was very sweet. So I monogrammed my in-laws names on it, one in white and one in light blue, because literally they have the same monogram. So that's how I solved that problem. 
And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people were concerned that we would be making these masks and they, they would be thrown away, but they're not, you know, they're washable, they're usable. So, um, you know, don't hesitate in using your supplies that are already at home and skills um, to use that. So let's see, Vicki Watkins, Watkins wants to know, should we be using the exquisite, exquisite PolyPro performance stabilizer into the mask or just using as a removable um, filler. Well, I'm in my mask, I use that polypro performance as a second piece of fabric. So I have the outer fabric, in my case was the t-shirt knit, and I lined it, my t-shirt knit with the polypro and, you know, right sides together and then turned it and treated that like a fabric. And so it's machine washable. I can launder it as often as I'd like. So that's how I used it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have them right here. They're, um, I don't have one here to show you, but they're outside the building. So uh, anyway, but that's how I used it. Two, two uh, layers together. I could probably put that on the blog. Let's see. And Deborah Morgan, you made them for your husband and yourself with cotton quilt batting. Not a bad idea. I don't know where you live, but we're in Texas. Yesterday it was 98 degrees here. So I, we're, you know, it's hot. It's really hot already. And, you know, batting would be hotter. So let's go ahead and... Uh, so Gloria Facemeyer wants to know, variegated thread, when are you going to start talking about that? So let's see, uh, we're going to do that right now. And Misha, you said, do not use knit fabric. Please do your own research. Absolutely. Do your own research. I am not uh, an authority on this matter at all. I just know that it is another layer of protection. And when it is also layered with a polypropylene stabilizer, it's a double layer of protection. And when you take your two pieces of fabric or one piece of fabric and a layer of stabilizer, hold it up to the light. And if it's opaque without a lot of light coming through, that's a good gu guideline that it is um, a, enough of a filter to protect you. Okay, so I have a very exciting woman that I want to uh, introduce you to, Anne McCarthy. I've had the honor of knowing her for oh, just maybe three years now. But she learned to sew over 20, well, when she was a child. And she learned from um, her mother. But first, she started doing doll clothes by hand. And then she, um, when her mother taught her how to use the sewing machine, she graduated to making clothes and home decor items. Uh, 20 years ago, she discovered the wonderful world of machine embroidery and applique. And that is when her life really exploded. A trained veterinarian. She brings a tremendous amount of skills to um, her, her craft, and I'm happy to welcome her here. So join me here, Anne. Anne, hi. It's just got her bunny ears on. I got bunny ears on. Yes, hello, everyone. Hi, Eileen. I'm hello. speaking to you all the way over in Colleyville, Texas. It's about 20 minutes from where you are, but good social distancing. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we were tempted to be in the same studio, but it's better safe than sorry for yes, sure. Yes. So, yeah. So happy Easter to everyone a few days early. Happy Passover, which I think started yesterday. And um, it's a really it's a nice time of the year. We're going to celebrate it anyway. And I think it's wonderful, wonderful to be invited to join you and all of the viewers out there. Oh, thanks, Aiden. Really, it's my honor to have you here. It's always okay. great to ha have an exciting guest like you. I know Isabel Brian from France. She says, nice ears. I are. know. Bienvenue, Isabel. I know. Nice ears. So um, we will get to variegated thread. I've got a lot of neat stuff to okay. talk to you about variegated thread and samples. But first, I want to do just two things, if I could. As Eileen said, it's it's a trying time. We are getting through this pandemic. We thank you to everyone who is patiently staying home as we are supposed to. But one thing, don't forget as you're staying home to wash your hands. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. This and was you know, done. I, there you I go. Know when People are staying home and they're washing their hands. And that's a great reminder, that sign, that that towel that you monogrammed or embroidered. But, you know, I know a lot of people are making the dime doors and you have oh, yeah. great dime doors. So let's flip back over to PowerPoint and show them before um, we advance. 
and talk about the variegated thread because some of these dime doors actually show um, variegated thread. So here's the four that we have so far, right? January, February, March, and April. Here is a close-up look of my two versions, a light and a dark one. And then we have um, Cheryl Richards and Nancy Engleton. I love their use of color. I mean, it's just, they're really excellent embroidery samples. Dorothy Jo Bailey McCullen and Mona Smith. You know, everybody selects different fabrics and gives it a really unique look. I think that's what's so fun about finding these dime doors out on the web. Um, and let's see, Sandra Conley, she uh, added the month to the building right, you know, above the signage, April. And Sandy R. Crury has added very subtle shading. Take a look at her stepping stones, though. She has used a variegated thread there. So um, it's interesting to see the difference, the effect that that gives versus Sandra's on the left where, you, and like mine, I just used a solid color thread. Another example of the variegated thread is Peggy Ayala um, on the door on the left. And she used a blue variegated thread. And then look at the Susan Asian wall on the right-hand side. Now that's a, a finer, uh, random uh, or a finer variegated thread. So that color changes more often on that spool than it would on the sample on the left. So just so interesting, isn't it? And here was two more examples. The one on the, on the, on the left has a low contrast variegated thread. So it's just a subtle effect. And yet look at Candy Bray's on the right-hand side. She used variegated thread in the wisteria blooms themselves. So they go from pinks to blues to lavenders and really a beautiful highlighting and shade light, shading that creates. But here's Ains. Look how creative she got. She didn't use variegated thread, but she sure had a good time. So Ain, maybe you would talk to us a little bit about your creation there. Yes, and you know, I link to your point exactly. It never ceases to amaze me how given the same design, gals will come up with doors that look so different and so creative and I just love it. And so, yes, it just, you know, occurred to me that it's just the sign of the times to put a face mask hanging from the door of the potting shed with a supply of hand sanitizer and the stash of toilet paper. Yeah. Funny, really great sense of humor, Ain. I yeah. love it. I love it. So, yeah. Okay, so let's now go back over to um, one of our first examples of the variegated thread. So, and I'll let you talk through this because you use variegated thread an awful lot. And I know you have some fabulous samples to share. I do. And, it, and it's very fun. And Eileen, if I could, let me just give a shout out to Jane Miller, who actually embroidered the washcloth that I just showed to wash hands. Jane oh. is at Richland Sewing Center, who is my dealer in Hearst, Texas. And shout out to them. And you know what? I put that washcloth at my kitchen sink just as a reminder that even though I'm staying at home, wash my hands, warm soap or warm water and soap and wash my hands and dry them. And that's the best thing that we can do. The other thing that I want to do is as everybody is putting their dealers up on the comments, you know what, you guys, our dealers need us now more than ever. So they are our happy place, and we certainly want to help them get through these challenging times. So I've got an idea. Call up your dealer. A lot of them are doing curbside service, even though they're not open. Call up your dealer and get a gift certificate, maybe for $25, $30, maybe even $50, and either give it to a friend or just keep it for yourself. So when we get through this and when the dealers open up again, Look, it'll be like found money and everybody will probably be needing supplies right about then. So you can go to your dealers and have a wonderful time shopping. So call them up and get that gift certificate. That's a great idea, Aim. Very nice yeah. of you to. And so them. now let's talk about variegated threads. Okay. And we're back to the PowerPoint and look at this. And listen, I'm a veterinarian, so you will see a number of samples that definitely have a animal type theme to them. But look at this gorgeous horse done in variegated threads. Beautiful. 
it's and beautiful. I think no. that design is from the, uh, I think several of the designs that you'll see here are from Urban Thread. So when I know it, I'll call it out. And if I don't okay. know, it, that's why I'm not mentioning it. That's what I thought. It, it looks like an Urban Thread design. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So by definition, variegated threads have a multicolored dye pattern. That means they're different colors along the entire length of the thread. Now, variegated thread can be various fiber contents. You can have rayon, you can have polyester, you can have cotton, you can even have silk content. And it comes in various weights. You can have 30 weight, 40 weight, 50 weight. But the main thing to remember about variegated threads, and we'll go to the next slide, is that it comes to in two main types of color patterns. You can either have a tone on tone, which has varying shades of a similar color pattern or a color family. And when it's sewn out, you see a gradient effect and you see the colors kind of blend into one another. The second type is a high contrast set of colors. This is usually colors that are very different from each other and it's a repeating pattern. And these stand out against the fabric that you might be using. So these are good choices when you want your thread to be visible against your background fabric. Now, as an illustration, you'll see on the next slide, the very same set of designs sewn out with a tone on tone on the left and then a sharp contrast color on the right. Satin stitch on the top and then a complex fill in the heart down below. So on the left, that's a tone on tone type of variegated thread. You'll see in the satin stitch how the threads kind of blend to each other. But then, and also in the gradient, the gradients that you see in the fill stitch down below in the heart pattern, it's just gorgeous. Now on the right, this is a high contrast color. So you see the, the, the blues and the, and the dark pink and the white stand out next to each other in the satin stitch. And that's really attractive. But then when you do a gradient fill, it's nice, but maybe that's not, you know, the, the color pattern that you're really looking for. But that one so, on the left, that would be a great way uh, to enhance the fur of an animal to use that variegated thread that has the low contrast, don't you think, Ain? Oh, I do. I think if you used, I mean, look at the complex fill when it's used, that has those subtle shaded shades that just kind of blend to each other. That would be great for fur or for landscape or for, you know, any kind of a, of an organic or natural type of uh, thing that you're designing, awesome. that you're stitching out. Yeah. So we have a question from um, Arlene Sullivan. She wants to uh, would go, go green, maybe is your last name. I'm sorry. Can you mix the various weights of thread? Well, you can mix various yeah. weights of thread for sure, but most variegated threads are all the same weight, um, but it's, when you mix weights of thread, your design pretty much has to be digitized for that because um, heavy heavyweight threads like a 30 weight or a 15 weight are cannot be as dense as designs that are digitized for normal 40 weight threads. So you have to have enough knowledge or understanding of software settings to make those changes to accommodate the different weights of thread. And Eileen, aren't most designs that you, that one would purchase digitized for 40 weight? Isn't that kind of the standard that the digitizers Absolutely. use? Unless yeah. it's called out, you know, in a particular fashion when you purchase it, then uh, definitely they're all digitized for 40 weight. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the samples that I'm going to show, I use the Medley Variegated Poly in the exquisite line of threads by Dime. These are precision dyed blends of maybe three colors, some have four colors, that repeat at random intervals. There's 15 different color combinations. This is a 40 weight polyester thread, and you can use it for quilting or for sewing or for machine embroidery. And let me just make sure that these are repeat at random intervals. We, you know, instead of the regular that says on the slide, we got a That's little right. mistake there. So. Don't worry. So it's random intervals, which is going to be important in just a minute. So this display you may have seen at your dealers showing all the 15 different color combinations. 
And if you haven't seen it, then certainly look for this when your dealer opens up again pretty soon. Or Fingers call them. They'll probably ship it to you, right? They might. Yeah. Call them. See if they have it. Deliver it curbside. But And you so, have a great um, method for really mastering the use of variegated threads. And I, I love this tip that you're about to share. It's really very impressive. So let's advance to that slide. And yes. you talk so, to so the question is, so I see it on the spool or on the cone, but how do I know what it will look like when I sew it out? So here's an idea. I go to my software, my PEP software, and I make about four, five, six, lines and I convert them to steel stitches, which are just consistent width of satin stitches. And I make it about four millimeters wide, five millimeters wide, which is about the standard width of a satin stitch. And so I will sew it out. I'll use maybe a couple of layers of a medium weight cutaway and I will label it with the thread number and then the name. And then I will cut these apart and put them with the cones of thread and keep it with the cones so that if I'm look, if I can't remember what it looks like, it's already sewn out, and I can pick the color combination that I want. Because it certainly brilliant. looks a little bit different than on the spool. Yeah, but Ain, that is brilliant. When I saw that, I was like, "Wow, why didn't I do that 20 years ago?" I mean, it, you know, it would take you about 20 minutes to do that task, and you'd have that sample, that reference forever. And it's just a great idea. Thank you for it, here. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. I like that. So now if you're interested and everybody should be convinced that they want to try more variegated thread, here's a great opportunity to get started with a six pack, a variety pack with six cones of thread available from Dime. And these are the medley variegated. These are popular colors. And so you will have a lot of fun. And these are, these are great to start with. Sew those out in a steel stitch and you'll see the beautiful color combinations in these six spools. So let's see some designs using variegated thread. Look at these gorgeous scissors. Now, these this was sewn out with, I'm pretty sure it was the zebra color combination. So these blacks and these grays and these kind of steel colors, they have a running stitch, which works great with variegated thread, but then look at the shading and the highlights on the blade and on the handles. It's absolutely gorgeous using a variegated thread. It really kind of delivers that nostalgic, that vintage look. Right. Imagine if you had just stitched that in one color, it wouldn't have, you know, mm -hmm. the, the appeal that it has in this variegated thread. It's a great way to really add extra interest to a, a simple design as a running yes. stitch design. Yes. Mm -hmm. And look at this design, these stacked cups. You know, this design reminds me of the tea towels that my mom would stamp with that heat transfer, those stamps, and then I would embroider these by hand. This is also a running stitch design. And I think it was done in the summer berries or these purple and pink tones. You see again, the highlighting and the shading. And since these threads, the medley threads are at random intervals, you get that subtle shading and you're not going to get the stripes that you would get if the thread was at, you know, every inch or every inch and a half, like in some threads. It's just, right. it's gorgeous. And Ain, if you were doing uh, several repeats of this same design in the same kind, in the same variegated spool, each stack would be different. And that would right. make it really great. on a That's thread. right. Can you imagine this on a set of eight to 10 napkins? you know, that cloth napkins, no two would be alike. Yeah, and Barbara McGinnis has, she's asked this question, isn't coloring kind of luck depending on where your color starts? Well, you know, yes, that's true. But I think by doing the test that uh, Ayn had illustrated earlier by testing that thread just by stitching a long satin stitch about six inches wide so you can really see how that thread is gonna lay down that gives you a good indication of what you can expect from that spool. Um, so it, this is not the type of thread you would use if you're, you know, if this section of a leaf has to be the dark green, you know, then 
find a solid color and go in that route. But if you have a little bit more leeway and you just want to have a more organic look, then variegated thread is a good solution for that. Absolutely, Eileen. It's a it's a it's a wonderful surprise that um, kind of a serendipitous like oh my gosh, this is gorgeous. So just the way that the colors fell. Okay, and the next one, quilting with variegated thread. Quilting was made for variegated thread, I think. Look at these couple of quilt blocks using the Pebble Passion quilting designs. And this was quilted with the Medley Variegated Thread Forest. Look at the light greens and the dark greens and the, and the um, really, and the darker greens as it comes out in this design. Now, again, these are random intervals, but the way this played out, it's absolutely stunning. And one big thing that I like about medley variegated thread is that I can find out the colors that the thread is made up of. So for example, if I, if I wanna do some coordinating designs with colors that match, I don't have to guess because for example here, I know that forest contains these four color numbers and color descriptions in the exquisite thread line. So I know exactly what the colors will be when I want to match them. That's awesome. Great tip. Yes. Yes. So in our next one, I think we've oh. got now, don't think that you have to limit yourself to just one cone of variegated thread. Look at this beautiful butterfly that used three different color combinations on this butterfly. So we look at, we've got a dark purples around the body and then the greens and the pinks in the wings. That's beautiful. That is gorgeous, just gorgeous. And you, you know, I want to, I'm gonna take over, I think I'm gonna to try to take over here for a second because uh, one of my office mates has hanging in his office, a Jimi Hendrix uh, work that I, I wanna share when you use variegated thread with black. So if you let me come up here full screen, I'll bring that up. How cool is that? So the variegated, of course, is all that color in his hair, but everything else is black. What a what great effect, really unique. So I just had to share that, very cool. That's remarkable. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So, so, and I think the, the next slide is also, was there one more with, uh, oh, the feather. Yes, let's get to the feather. Oh, it's stunning. Again, yes. this is a uh, an urban threads design. Beautiful. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So again, don't limit yourself to just one cone of variegated thread. Look, and this is out of the box thinking, who would have thought that uh, you could use three different colors in that feather? It's beautiful. Yeah. Great idea. Okay. And now satin stitches, if you look at your design and you see it's mostly satin stitches, then consider maybe looking for one of the tone on tones or the subtle color change color combinations because those work better with uh, a satin stitch. Look at this, um, this poem and done in kind of the softer colors. I think this probably was Desert Canyon in the variegated medley, in the medley. Uh -huh. So um, it's beautiful. So you don't have the striping effect. You've just got these subtle color blends. Very cool. And I think you have some live samples that you want to show, right? So let me get you I up do. on the screen. I do. I just really jumped into variegated thread and wondered how it would look sewn out in freestanding lace. So the first sample, I want you to see that's how it looks sewn out in freestanding lace. Beautiful. So this is the denim blues in the medley line. And I sewed it out as a freestanding lace to see what it looked like. And that gave me inspiration finally to embroider a jean jacket that I have had hanging on my wall for uh, almost a year. And so I used those designs, which are from my lace maker, these are one of the 1100 designs that are included in the My Lace Maker software. And I use them to sew designs on this jean jacket. And if you notice, that's the front, but then look at the back. Wow, gorgeous. 
And all of these designs, again, are sewn out with the denim blues. And one of the things that I really love about the My Lace Maker software is that you get the whole design, but then you also get smaller complementary designs that go with and match your larger design so that you can pick out designs that particularly fit in a space that you're going to, to embroider. Like for example, this fits right in the center of the back yoke. And then in the front, because this has a lot of seaming detail up at the yoke and also down the front, I was able to design exactly the designs that would fit in those spaces using the My Lace Maker software. So I didn't have to worry about trying to find matching designs that fit in that space. I used the coordinating designs in My Lace yeah, Maker. Aine, before you get started, um, we yeah. have a question from Quilt Shop Gal. On your first lace sample that you showed that kind of sparkly fabric, what was that? Look at this, it's a piece of felt. Felt, wow. Felt it's just a piece sparkly. of felt, which I thought really set off the blues in the denim. So it's called glitter felt. Glitter felt, okay. Glitter felt. More stuff to get, you know, in our sewing room, right? I know. It. And now, and talking about things that, that I was talking about things that match with the denim jacket. Now I also made <laughs> fringe earrings oh, how that fun. match the denim jacket out of the denim blues. Now you see that that the striping effect of this variegated thread works very well. Yeah. And I'm holding them with my forceps so I don't have my fingers in the way. <laughs> Great, they're beautiful. You know, uh, Melissa uh, Melissa Harrison had a question. Did you stitch directly on the jacket or do them separately and then attach afterwards? Well, you know what? I did a combination of both. I had sewed, these, sewed some of these out as freestanding lace and liked them so much that then I sewed them on the back of the jacket. And that's these two. And I just tacked them on there by hand. But okay. these were sewn directly on the jacket. Okay. And the front designs were sewn directly on the jacket. Could not have done this if I didn't have my snap hoop monster, awesome. which is the magnetic hoop. Because then it, it's it you don't have to um, try to put those welt seams in the standard hoop. Right. That was, that's the life changer, that snap hoop monster. But I also want to show that, look at what also you can do with the lace <laughs> earrings. You can put crystals on them. Yeah. And so, and these are from, I'm going to do the plug. Those lace earrings are from the Lace Charm Collection by Eileen. Thank you, Aime. Yeah, yes. And your dealer has these, and that's an easy curbside delivery service. Yeah. So it's kind of the answer to, hey, you know what? The answer to the question of can you have too much embroidery or can you have too many crystals and sparkly things? And that answer is no. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Anne, you know, Judith Schwartz here is kind of, you know, breaking the rules. She wants to know what the inside of the jacket looks like. Well, when I teach people, I always tell them, if you want to be disappointed, look inside my garment. <laughs> so I don't know how you feel about that. You know, if you want to. Um, I'm going to take, I'm going to, you want me to undress my silver dolly? Yeah. I will show you the inside because I, I think I can be proud of that. Good I think. Okay, I'm going to be brave. There's the inside of the back. Oh, yeah. Look at that. And one of the, the stabilizer I used was um, Peace and Stitch, which I think has some water-soluble fibers in it so that when this jacket goes through the wash, those pieces of stabilizer that you might see there are going to go away. And then there are two there. Okay, so what other okay. great samples do you have? Here's another great sample I have. Let me put the, that. 
Oh, speaking of sparkly things, true to the season, I also used my lace maker software to design a couple of Easter eggs using Kingstar metallic thread in the background grid. And wow. then for the designs, I used the variegated threads. And you can see these are the soft tone on tones, the pastels and the, the pink um, cotton candy, candy canes. It's candy canes for the pink. Worked Beautiful. out perfectly. How do you keep that shape, that really solid oval egg shape? How, how are you maintaining that? You mean, uh, well, this is, um, did it on water soluble mm -hmm. and I didn't rinse it out totally. I used kind of uh, not hot, hot water because I wanted these to have some body. And so I used kind of tepid water and I just rinsed it enough to get the, the um, water soluble out of it, the um, sew and wash out of it, the gummy out of it. And then let them dry, and so right. they are—they have a lot of body with them still. Yes, so it's all in the rinsing, really, right? It's all in the rinsing. It's all in the rinsing. As as you've said, Eileen, the dissolution of your sew and wash of your water soluble stabilizer is temperature dependent, not only on the rate of dissolution but the extent of dissolution. So the hotter the water, the more quickly and the more completely your so water soluble stabilizer is going to go away. I see. And I have, let's see. Here's an out of the box way to, to work with variegated threads. Have you ever thought of making fringe? Wow. So this is also an option for designs in my lace maker software. And as you can see, you make fringe, you sew it on to a decorative ribbon like this. And it's a great way to, add an embellishment to something that might go around a hat band or table decoration or any kind of uh, item that you want to use it. And I use the patriotic threads because you see how well those distinct stripes look Yeah, with the red, white, and blue. That's great. You can make fringe. Mm -hmm. And also you can do, think about if you're doing I'm currently working on a number of blocks using a crazy quilt. I just love crazy quilt blocks. And don't forget, you can use variegated threads on your crazy quilt block decorations. And if you'll see, here's one block. And then here's the variegated thread that I used on the crazy quilt. Now, and also variegated thread is just made for that running quilt stitch. This one, and I'm going to stand up and show you the whole thing. This is the Sassy Cats. That's adorable. I love those bright colors. For stipple. I'm going to raise it up. Let me see if I can get back a little bit and you can see the whole thing. That's beautiful. There we go. So this is applique, but then in the border blocks, you see designs that are sewn out, they're quilted in their stitches. So I used variegated thread yeah. to sew out the fishes. Very fun, very fun. That's a great application for it. And it really makes the fishes really, it makes them fun and whimsical and fun to be with, as if you're gonna be with fishes. So now Eileen, I'm gonna turn it back to you to show how to continue showing how variegated threads are a great choice in quilting with your embroidery machine. Okay, and actually today on the Weightless Quilter, I thought I would share what I have on my Weightless Quilter today. Um, I have a, a new cheater quilt that I designed for my own use, and I am stitching one of Amelia Scott Designs, uh, her expansion packs on that quilt, that circle design, and I'm using a variegated thread and I'll show you a closer look to that. So let me show <clears throat> in PowerPoint, this is that quilt that I worked on through March, remember, and it's all done. And I showed you last week how I used the weightless quilter to do binding. And so that is home on my bed, it's in use now, but the design that I used I hope I have an image of that. Oh, here it is. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? 
It's that's our sunset variegated and it is just so colorful. I stitched it here in black so you could get a good look at it. Of course, on that red ribbon quilt up here, you're not really going to be able to detect that thread, right? With all those beautiful fabrics. So sometimes, you know, you want to select a thread that just blends and that most certainly is what I did on red ribbons. But you know, during the, um, the week, we get an awful lot of customer service inquiries about the weightless quilter and how to set it up. So I thought I would show you, this is the image how it is here in, the, uh, in my studio in this space here. And that's a rather small table. So I have my floor bars and poles outside of the table. So one floor bar is on the left-hand side of the table and then the back floor bar is behind the table. But possibly, uh, and now you can see, same setup that you see in these images and with the poles extended. It comes with four floor bars and eight poles, but really with an embroidery machine, I'm only using three poles that you know extend up to hold the quilt and then I'm using two floor bars. So that just so you know, there's no real wrong way. If you have a wider table, like a folding table, or maybe your dining room table that you use to quilt large projects, I would slide that floor bar underneath the table on the left-hand side, and then the floor bar would be behind it, or that could also be um, in, in back, uh, underneath the table too, depending on the size of your table. But the weightless quilter is very flexible. Like you can set it up however fits your space. This is a machine cabinet uh, piece of furniture that goes all the way to the floor. And the floor bars, the height of a floor bar is three quarters of an inch. So if you can't get it under your table, then you could um, put it outside the table. So I just thought I would kind of share those images because we get an awful lot of questions. And Carolyn Taylor says that she would love to see the backs of the quilts that were quilted with an embroidery machine. Um, okay, uh, next week, I'll, I'll get images for you. I could hold a quilt up here, but it, that would be a mess, I can tell. Well, actually I have one right here. So y'all just, hey, why don't you come and chat for a minute and I will uh, go grab that quilt. So. Okay, I'm back. Okay. Can you read, let me see if I've got some, um, any questions? Any questions? I'm trying to think of what else I should. Let's see what else I've got here. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, Carolyn Taylor. Those are good. To, yeah, Carolyn Taylor wanted to see the backs of quilts. So okay. I'm going to bring this. Oh, you have a back there. Well, no, I looked at this and and I did it with um. I put the backing on during the um during the assembly. Okay. But I so have one in the next room. Do you have one? Yeah, I do. So Carolyn, this is the back of the quilt. You can see some tie, one tie off, you know, and one start. And then this is the front and you don't see any tie offs or starts. Now, I'll tell you, um, Carolyn, I'm not that picky. You know, I do a lot of quilting. Uh, what I wanted to do is tie off and not disassemble. So that's important to me. I don't worry about burying those thread tails. I know many people will take the time to do that. But on like Red Ribbons quilt, there were over 85 hoopings. I am definitely not going to, you know, take a needle and, you know, work that bobbin tail into the quilt. That's not what I'm going to do. If it bothers you, um, you can use a busy back fabric. So we find a print that's a, a little bit busy and that will camouflage the tie offs in the back. I like to coordinate my back with my front and I use the same thread in both the needle and the bobbin. So that's why I coordinate my fabric so that that thread will look um, attractive on both sides of the quilt. That's pretty much my rule of thumb. And Eileen, I've got um, um, the stipple baby in progress that will illustrate exactly what you're talking about. Okay. So great. this is another stipple baby. It's in progress. This is one row. And it is a quilt that has that has different rows, and it's a clothesline yes. that will hang various baby clothes. So this is, and it is a quilt as you go. So this is the front. Oops, there we go. Nice. Okay. 
Now, if I turn it around, I'll show you that same area on the back. And as Eileen said, I use a pretty busy print on the back right. to hide some of the tie-offs. And I also got this tip. I increased my top embroidery tension by uh, just one click when I'm doing quilt. And so it kind of makes that? a little bit more balanced stitch. For a more balanced stitch? Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so you see the tie-offs, you see, yeah. you know, where the pants right. were. And you know, every quilt, they, it has a front and a back. I mean, it does. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So we don't wear our clothes inside out. <laughs> no, no. Right? So why do no. we worry about that? Yeah. Yes. Anyway. Okay. So do we have any other questions? Uh, Terry Bavona, she wanted to know what about the bobbin. And so we answered that. She's satisfied with that. So, and which Delia also asked what thread for the bobbin. I always match the top. I, when I'm quilting, I skip that embroidery bobbin, you know, thread. I don't want that lightweight. I want the same weight top and bottom. That's what mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so next week, I'm pretty excited. Uh, we have two Facebook Lives next week. So let's go ahead and talk about that. On Tuesday, I'm going to uh, go live at 1 o'clock on April 14th with Ashley Jones is going to join me. And we are going to do Perfect Embroidery Pro. We're going to spend a, a good solid half hour, 45 minutes, maybe an hour on Perfect Embroidery Pro. We have uh, some simple lessons, and then we're going to field your questions. So um, that's for software owners. And then next Thursday, we have an action-packed um, afternoon then too. So you'll have to, if you like us on Facebook, you'll be notified when we're going live. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will also be noti notified, when, notified when we're going live. Um, if you don't have any more questions, I'm going to sign off. And I most certainly want to thank AIM for um, joining me today. It was great to have you here. It was um, a pleasure. Yeah. And thank I'm you, everyone, welcome. for joining. Yeah. Wash your hands, right? Love that message that you gave everybody. Yeah. That's wonderful. And um, happy holiday. Happy pa Passover and Easter to all of those who celebrate that. And stay well keep safe, and enjoy this time at home. It's it's a gift of time that we don't often get. Bye for now. That's true. Yeah.